place that has anything to influence the the opinion of both both sides, the Palestinian and the Israeli side, or this is just politics, another version of the politicians trying to, to influence the, the, the situation they are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. Uh, Hi. Uh, my question is about the recent evacuation of Amona. Like, mm -hmm. uh, it's gotten a lot of coverage. You know, it's the usual disproportionate coverage of the Israeli perspective. Hardly do we ever hear about the demolition of Palestinian homes in '48 or '67. So, like, what do you think that was like? Is this part of the whole theater necessary to help Thomas? Uh, sorry, uh, David Friedman's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this is now, it's too late to talk about him, but can you talk a little bit about Barack Obama? <coughs> I mean, I'm majorly disappointed with him. I thought for a black president, he should have came forth a little more for the Palestinian cause, and it was just too late when he was on his way out, is when Kerry spoke, and it's just a major disappointment for him. Just talk a little bit about him. Sure. And this is my husband. <coughs> uh, Great questions. Um, I'm optimistic because of the leadership that's being put forward by Palestinian civil society uh, in the form of the call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions uh, against Israel, against corporations and institutions which are not only complicit in Israel's oppression of Palestinians, but profiting from it in many cases. Uh, and I'm optimistic because uh, it is taking the Palestinian BDS movement much less time to attain the type of victories that were attained in the South African boycott and divestment context. And that's not because Palestinians are smarter than South Africans or better organizers or anything like that. I'm sure if South Africans had the internet and Facebook and YouTube back then when they launched their uh, anti-apartheid campaign, they probably would have ended apartheid sooner uh, as well. The, the way we're able to communicate and to connect with other people in this day and age uh, makes transnational organizing uh, so much easier and more effective. And we've seen that in many cases, the BDS movement has been successful in bringing multi-billion dollar multinational corporations to their knees and forcing them to end their business relationships with Israel. It still boggles my mind that some of Israel's supporters say, oh, BDS doesn't matter. Uh, and then the Israeli government turns around and spends 25, about $25 million a year on propaganda efforts uh, in the West, in the United States in particular, to try to counter uh, the BDS movement. But I'm very optimistic because the BDS movement is making such amazing inroads into college campuses, mainstream church denominations, uh, even into very conservative institutions like the National Football League. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of you probably saw that we ran a campaign a couple weeks ago <coughs> calling on players who were uh, being paid uh, to go on this junket to Israel not to go on the trip. And led by Seattle Seahawks star Michael Bennett, uh, six out of the 11 wound up canceling because they didn't want to be used, mm -hmm. in the words of Michael Bennett, by Israeli propaganda. So if we can penetrate institutions like the NFL, it's very conservative, uh, it, it, it brings me a tremendous amount of optimism. Because I do believe, as unequal as we are, as racist as this country is, uh, as troubling our history is of slavery and genocide against the indigenous people, we still manage to have this concept of ourselves in our mind as supporting democracy and equality and human rights. This is our self-image, at least for white people, the bulk of them. Uh, and so the, the, the gross inequality that uh, prevails under permanent Israeli military occupation, uh, occupation and apartheid the Palestinians is simply just not going to fly with the American people. And that will eventually translate into policy change. That's why, that's why I'm optimistic. Uh, so the grassroots movement that we're seeing today uh, is not about one state versus two state. The Palestinian civil society in the form of the BDS movement has been very clear. We're looking to attain our long-denied rights. 
We're not talking about uh, particular frameworks or solutions or what needs to be negotiated uh, at the table. Uh, Yoshi made mention of the, the small Israeli settlement of Amona, which was built on private Palestinian land and uh, evacuated by Israel a few weeks ago. This is part of a charade that Israel goes through every five or ten years. They evacuate some small, unimportant little outposts that aren't part of their strategic plan for colonization. And then once they do that, as a reward to the settler movement, they'll issue tenders for like 5,000 new settlement units, which was uh, the case with, with Amon. Uh, so, you know, it's all, it's, it's all part of this theatrics that Israel goes through, you know, so that the international media can see these wrenching scenes of Israelis crying and being torn from their outpost and defying the Israeli army. And it's a way for the Israeli government to say, look, look how difficult it was for us to evacuate just a couple hundred people right. from this little hilltop. There's no way we can do it for 650,000 people. So they're going to have to stay in place. So it's all part of theatrics and, and, and a game. Uh, Obama. <laughs> 350 pages of my disappointment uh, in his presidency uh, on, on this issue. And the reason why I had such high hopes for President Obama when he entered the White House is because he did understand the plight of the Palestinian people coming into the presidency. Uh, one of his close friends and colleagues in Chicago was Professor Rashid Khalidi, who taught with him at, at the University of Chicago. And this is all well documented and how he used to attend Palestinian community events in Chicago and sat with Edward Said and all of this is well known and even public statements that he made. And you can read Ali Abu Nama's account of what President, then Illinois State Senator, said to him on Electronic Intifada about how he really encouraged him to keep doing this activism because he understood that the U.S. was biased. Uh, so. He knew all these things. And for a while, it looked like maybe there was a plan and maybe things were going to change. Because if you remember what now seems like an eternity, back to 2009 when he first took office, he came in very strongly, and the entire administration did, demanding that Israel freeze its settlements in a way that no president had done in a very long time. Everyone else gave it lip service, but Obama came down very hard and said, you've got to freeze this. You've got to stop all colonization if we're going to have a credible negotiating process. And he was, of course, right. Uh, what, what happened, and then he went to Cairo in May of 2009 and delivered what I thought was an excellent speech. It was an excellent speech. And he recognized the plight of the Palestinian people. And that the plight of the Palestinian people was not limited to those living under military occupation, but he made reference to Palestinian refugees exiled by Israel in 48 as well. No president had ever done that before while in office. And it was quite path-breaking and encouraging. Uh, what happened? I won't give away all the secrets to my book because I want you all to get a copy. Mm -hmm. uh, but in essence, what happened is that he got pushed back from the usual suspects, from the Israel lobby, and he capitulated. He didn't put up a fight, mm -hmm. which was the case on many, many policy issues where he faced resistance from either outside forces or from Congress. So, you know, my, my takeaway from Obama, great rhetoric, great vision, uh, really didn't have an understanding of how Washington works. Mm -hmm when he came into the presidency and really wasn't the type of president who knew how to twist arms to get things done. I'm not talking about just this issue in general. That's my, my broad critique. You know, uh, LBJ, President Johnson, once famously said that what is the point of having political capital if you don't use it? And this is a, a, a summation of Obama's presidency. He had a ton of political capital when he entered office, but he chose not to use it, and especially on this issue. Okay, let me take another round. Let's do one and two.
And three. Yes. Go ahead. I guess, um, thank you for, for your lecture tonight. My question is more or less about Gaza and the Gaza blockade. Um, I know you're optimistic about the one state solution, but what does that mean for, for Gaza and for the blockade? Um, if you can you just address that? Yeah. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, yes, please. Uh, my question is, what do you think about this one state democratic um, solution? What would they do with the land that's been exposed to? You know, appropriated from all the settlements, etc. How would they give that back to the Palestinians? And maybe um, if you could shed some light on what happened in South Africa. Has that land been given back to some of the indigenous people? Mm -hmm. Good questions. Yes, please. Hi. Um, when Netanyahu came, um, I went to a protest in New York City and I noticed um, <coughs> Jewish Voices for Peace, Palestinians on one side. On the other side were Israeli flag, giant Trump banners. What is your take on? The view, I mean, just Trump aligning, Israel aligning itself with Trump. Um. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah, thank you for raising the question of Gaza because it's often one uh, neglected in, in the current conversation. And actually, during Kerry's negotiations in, in 2013, 2014, they actually excluded Gaza completely. Gaza was not even on the agenda. So it was to create this state minus in the West Bank and figure out what to do with Gaza later. Uh, the Israeli plan for Gaza has always been to warehouse Palestinians and to uh, get the now nearly 2 million Palestinians who live there uh, out of uh, Israel's responsibility. Uh, Israel, I think, wrongly believes that it can keep Gaza under blockade uh, indefinitely. Uh, as you doubtless know, the humanitarian situation in, in, in Gaza is catastrophic. Only 5% of the drinking water is potable. The UN has uh, put out a report saying that Gaza will not be habitable for human beings by 2020. That's just three years from now. And it might not even be that long. So what's going to happen when you have two million human beings who simply cannot live in this open air prison uh, any longer? Uh, they're not going to be contained by, by fences and walls. Uh, as we see today in Syria, uh, as we see today with the U.S.-Mexico border, when human beings are determined because of privation or uh, war or economic considerations to flee their homes and to try to migrate across borders, they will do it, no matter what borders and obstacles are put in their way. So uh, it will have to be dealt with. Uh, you know. I, I, I think it's conceivable that you know, Hamas has dug all of these tunnels, reportedly, to better fight the Israeli military. And of course, this was the, the context of the last devastating attack on Gaza in 2014. I mean, look, is there a possibility that Palestinians are simply going to walk out of the Gaza Strip one day? Maybe. I mean, that could happen when it becomes uninhabitable. Um, and by the way, of course, most of the Palestinians who live in Gaza are originally not from Gaza. 80% are refugees, some of whom live only a few kilometers away from their demolished villages. Uh, so, you know, their, their right of return, uh, the right of return of all Palestinian refugees is, of course, uh, a part of, a necessary part of, uh, a just one-state solution. Uh, land expropriation... That's a very good question. Um, in this legal memo that I referred to from 1947, it talked about how uh, land use would have to be set up so that it would benefit all the inhabitants of Palestine. And when you're talking about the transition from apartheid today to democracy and equality sometime in the future, you have to deal with not only land expropriations post-1967, but you also have to deal with the original land expropriations which followed the Nakba. 
1949 to 1950, Israel expropriated virtually all private and public Palestinian land, made it state land, turned it over to the Jewish National Fund, only for the use of Jewish people. So the whole issue of land use will have to be decolonized. It will have to be uh, readjusted so that it's no longer in the hands of uh, an exclusivist organization that only works for the benefit and rights of some people. It will obviously have to be uh, administered uh, in a way that's fair and just for all. Uh, the specific mechanics of it, I don't know. But I guarantee you, when this happens, the US is going to put up billions of dollars in aid to figure out how to do it. Uh, the, is the Israel alignment with Trump, this is a natural and logical outcome of a process that has been underway for the last 20 years. If you look back at public opinion polling, 20 years ago, at the start of the so-called peace process, there was virtually no difference in your party affiliation and what you thought about Israel and the Palestinians. Virtually the same numbers of liberals and conservatives sympathized with Israel over the Palestinians. It used to be that there was absolutely no difference between the Democratic and Republican Party when it came to this issue. But things have dramatically changed in the last generation. This is another reason why I'm very optimistic is because today you don't have that unanimity. In fact, you have a gaping partisan gap between the two parties. And if you look at public opinion polling today, I hope I, I, hope I get the numbers right. The latest Pew uh, opinion poll from January of this year found that 70, I think it was 79 percent of conservatives sympathized with Israel and 8 percent sympathized with Palestinians. Liberals, on the other hand, sympathized 40 percent with Palestinians and only like 25 percent 